We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Yusuf Moneer. He is the executive director of the uh, U.S. campaign for uh, ending the occupation uh, in the uh, Palestinian territories and a policy analyst at the Arab uh, Center uh, and also has written a piece in The Nation magazine, There's Only One Way to Destroy ISIF. Uh, Yusuf, welcome to the program. Thanks. It's good to be with you. Uh, so let's... Um, the the you, you start your piece with a uh, analogy about uh, counterterrorism strategy, um, a, a boiling pot analogy. Walk us through that, and and then let's talk about how that uh, applies in the context of of um, uh, of ISIS. Sure. Well, you know, I've, I've always thought that the best way to think about counterterrorism strategy is this boiling pot analogy. And I would encourage your listeners to think about the uh, situation where one is confronted with a, a boiling pot of water uh, and then facing the challenge of preventing any bubbles from rising to the top. Uh, now, there are a couple ways that you can go about uh, meeting this challenge. You could um, attempt to individually destroy every bubble before it reaches the surface. Uh, you could attempt to disrupt uh, these bubbles uh, before they can even uh, really make it halfway up or at the very early stages of their formation. Uh, but uh, that becomes difficult to do over time because as the heat rises, more and more bubbles are created. Your uh, uh, counter uh, bubble capabilities, if you will, are limited. And eventually, a bubble is going to get to the top. And, of course, we know that when a terrorist attack happens, uh, the costs of a terrorist attack are far greater than uh, a bubble uh, rising to the top of a boiling pot. The other uh, uh, pathway towards uh, solving this challenge is finding a way to turn down the heat below that pot of water, um, essentially uh, resolving uh, or dealing with the conditions that help generate uh, terrorism. Uh, and in the case of um, uh, ISIS, really one of the major conditions that led to the creation of ISIS, the development um, that, that, that really made the fertile ground available for ISIS to rise uh, was, uh, of course, the destruction of the Iraqi state during the U.S. invasion of Iraq and the subsequent dismantlement of the state. And then, of course, the Syrian civil war, which has led to a very large, uh, vast uh, space uh, that straddles Syria and Iraq, uh, which is essentially uh, ungoverned uh, and became ungoverned and was filled uh, by, uh, by ISIS, what became ISIS. I think it's important to remember that, you know, we often talk about ISIS and al-Qaeda as if they're these entirely separate things that generated from completely different places, but the core of ISIS was al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, and it was uh, something that developed in Iraq uh, during the uh, insurgency, during the American occupation, found its way into Syria uh, in the vacuum that was created in the Civil War, uh, and then uh, developed into what we now know as uh, ISIS. And of course, went back into Iraq and took over uh, swaths of territory between both countries. Um, there's really only one way uh, to resolve this issue, which is the point that I tried to make in my piece, and that's, you know, not simply through airstrikes, uh, because, you know, this problem developed because you have this ungoverned territory, this vacuum of power. Um, and, and what needs to happen is that that space needs to be reoccupied by sovereign authorities, uh, and in this case, a, a Syrian authority and an Iraqi authority, uh, that can bring order to that space once again. All right, um, let, me, and, let me just, let me just stop you there, and, and, and uh, we'll work back up to that point, because uh, just give us a sense, I mean, because, you know, one of the, the 
the problems, I think, in terms of that that notion that uh, I mean, I, I think it's it's clear. And, and, and President Obama was making this point over the past two days, which I think was actually a very good point, is that we could theoretically. Right. I mean, and I don't know who we is in this scenario, but uh, a coalition, a broad coalition of forces could uh, theoretically um, with uh, air support, uh, enter into that area, re-fight uh, uh, a war, I guess we would get back to sort of some semblance where, uh, at the very least in Iraq, and, and maybe it would be a little bit more complicated because of, 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 the, of the myriad of different parties involved in, in Syria, uh, we could, through uh, a direct military action on the ground, uh, I guess, beat back these forces or make them recede into the, uh, the population, but we would have to stay there, right? And so the, uh, and you're suggesting, at least in the context of, of, of Iraq and Syria, that they, there needs to be sovereign forces there. On the Iraq side, let's just take that for a moment. We know, or at least uh, I've read, that uh, some 90% of, uh, of ISIS in Iraq are Iraqis, and presumably these are uh, those uh, people, or at least the core, comes from uh, uh, al-Qaeda in Iraq, uh, which in many respects sort of came out of the, the debathification, the, the, um, the, the Sunni Ba'athist uh, generals and uh, leadership of, of uh, Saddam Hussein's army, uh, or, different, or different forces, I should say. And, and so... Who could that sovereign be in Iraq if not the Shia who sort of gave rise to the, um, I guess, the context which gave rise to ISIS? In, in other words, the, you know, had there been sort of some effective power sharing or had there been an, a, a capacity for power sharing, and maybe there isn't. Uh, and that's part of the problem with that, with the uh, U.S. invasion. Um, then you would not have seen perhaps that rise of what we now call ISIS in Iraq. Who, who could that sovereign be? Well, look, I think um, th there's, there's, there's really two ways to go about it, right? We can talk about um, restoring a central government in what were the previous territorial borders of the Iraqi state, um, the, the same borders of the Iraqi state under Saddam, for example, uh, or we can talk about some form of uh, partitioning, right? Um, but, but the notion that partitioning um, Iraq is in any way going to be less uh, conducive to conflict generation, I think, is misguided. Uh, I think that only sets you down a, a, a further path uh, of conflict. This is not an easy problem to solve. Right. Uh, and I, I think it, it, that needs to be understood. It needs to be understood that this is a very difficult problem. It is going to take a serious American engagement, mostly on the diplomatic side, not on the military side. Uh, and it's going to take some, some serious introspection into the disaster that was the policy choice of going to war in Iraq. Because there's a lot of lessons that need to be learned from that. And unfortunately, it seems many people who are talking about this issue today uh, refuse to want to learn. Uh, you pointed out that the president said, you know, we uh, would have to go in on the ground and reoccupy that territory. And look, the thing is, we did that in Iraq for 10 years. Right. Okay? That, at some point, you have to leave. Okay, and, and, and everybody knows that, including the insurgents on the ground. So they lay low and wait till you leave, and then they reoccupy that vacuum. And the other option is perpetual occupation, which not only is essentially illegal, but it doesn't work. And if, and if you, if you want to know how well it doesn't work, just ask the Israelis who have been occupying Palestinian territory now for 50 years and are nowhere closer to resolving the challenge of of political violence. So um, what needs to happen here is that there needs to be a, a, a representative government that retake this space uh, in a way that serves the people on the ground. And it's not going to be easy. And there's a lot of challenges that have to be dealt with. And a big part of it, and you, you make an important point when you talk about uh, the, the disaffected Sunni population of Iraq. Um, and really, Sunni populations in, in, in many Shia-dominated areas um, 
and vice versa across the region where you have disaffected Shia populations in Sunni areas. This can be resolved in part by trying to dial back the broader Saudi-Iranian confrontation in right. the region, because that is what's creating a lot of the incentives for some of these players to choose conflict over compromise. Give, um, give us a and, sense. Give us a sense of how that is played out in the context of Syria, because I mean, largely speaking, um, these these proxy uh, wars. I mean, and 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 that seems to me to be, you know, there's almost like two levels, two two co-incentric levels at least of of proxy wars that are going on here. Uh, particularly as we get to, to, to Syria, and we're talking now about uh, the Russians and uh, the, the, the Russian agenda that is sort of layered on top of the, um, the, the, Syria, or the Assad agenda, which is also sort of uh, um, uh, intersects with the Iranian agenda, whereas there was the Saudi agenda, which it seems to be they they may have overreached in their mind in terms of uh, of helping uh, in many respects fund what uh, ultimately or, or providing funds which ultimately ended up in ISIS um, and the U.S. agenda which also seems to be um, somewhat ambiguous. If you could give us just a sense of 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 where all of those different in agendas stand, particularly in the case of of Syria. Well, it's, it's, it's a big mess, and there's a lot of players, and there's a lot of different interests. But I think where you start is at, at the intra-Syrian level, where you have a Syrian government, a Syrian regime, the Assad regime, and a Syrian opposition. Um, and the, the Assad regime is a, um, an ethnic, religious, minority-based regime that has governed a, uh, a state with, which is essentially a, a ethno-religious majority that is not... Of the, of the regime's background. So you have this Alawite core that dominates a regime that is governing a primarily Sunni state. Uh, and, and while there's some, some crossover between, it's really been about a, a family and a close click to that family that has been able to dominate uh, government and interests in Syria through a very repressive regime at, at the expense of the majority of, of the population there. Uh, and for the Assad regime, there's really, um, you know, th there's no way out of this at this point, uh, but to continue to fight just to survive. That's the way that they view this. Uh, and um, for the, the opposition, uh, they too believe that there's really no way out of this but to continue to fight until there's an unconditional surrender uh, from the uh, from the regime because they do not want to go back to a pre civil war day because they know precisely um, of how vicious the regime the regime was in terms of their repression of civilians prior to the war uh, and and um, and it would be only worse um, in in the days after if the regime was to stay completely intact um, so there's that layer. The next step up is the sort of the Saudi-Iranian um, contest in the region. Uh, and the, the Saudis have viewed Syria as an opportunity to check Iranian power in the region. Uh, obviously, this was um, uh, set off by the um, removal of the Saddam Hussein regime, which, as evil as it was, was nonetheless viewed by Saudi Arabia as a bulwark against mm -hmm. Iranian influence in the region. It was the Jenga block that was pulled by the United States that caused everything to crumble. Uh, and it gave Iranian additional influence across the region that it did not previously have. Now, the Saudis want to, to check that, and they're, they're perfectly willing to fight to the last Syrian to do that. And mind you, the Iranians are perfectly willing to fight to the last Syrian to try to maintain their ally in Syria as well. Um, the next level up is the broader, you know, geostrategic um, contest uh, by bigger players. Uh, here we can talk about the the, the Turks, which have an interest, um, and 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 others as well. But specifically in Syria, you have to take into account Russian interests, which have been.
uh, on the ground and developing in Syria since the days of the Cold War, and they are quite deep, actually. Um, and the Russians are willing to go to great extents to defend um, their interests there, and they've demonstrated that uh, by now mobilizing militarily uh, in Syria. And I think everybody knew for some time that Russian uh, intervention, military intervention in Syria um, was, uh, was going to happen at some point or, or, or was a possibility. Uh, and now that that's taken place, I actually think it provides an opportunity because every Russian card in their hand has been played now. Right. Uh, and the, the Russians are facing a prospect in Syria where the longer they stay involved, uh, the more costs that they're going to take, and, and, and they're really fighting to save a sinking ship in the Assad regime. Um, so the incentives for them to come to the table in, in a way um, have increased.